are back with an all new edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net. My name is James Sabalski. He is the Razor, Andrew Raycroft, hanging at Amen Corner. Is that where you're at, buddy? <laughs> I wish. No, <laughs> I wish. I got all my stories from Kami. That was it. Oh, nicely done. Right. Uh, Kami, Mike Commodore, also in the house. Uh, Kami, where do we find you on your uh, planes, trains, and automobiles adventure this week? Uh, you know what? It's been pretty much straight Scottsdale since last time. I'm here for uh, about another 10 days or so. I'm not even sure what day it is, but uh, <laughs> the 22nd, I have to go to Calgary because okay. Robin Regeer and I, uh, we kind of co-chair, if I'm being totally honest, uh, Robin Regeer runs the tournament and I'm just kind of there. And thank God, <laughs> because if he wasn't involved, this tournament would be a total meltdown because I i don't even know where I'm going to be the next week. So it's good he's in charge, but the uh, the Flames Alumni Golf Tournament on the 25th. Nice. So that's next up, yeah. Look at, I mean, if, if you and Robin Regeer are kind of the organizers, I can only imagine how this thing must unravel on the golf course. Totally fair one in regards to me, <laughs> but I will tell you, Robin Regeer has his shit together. I was going to say, like, he, he, he kind of keeps yeah. it together, yeah. And not kind of. Like, he is on top of things. He is organized. He is not scared to say what is, like, Robin Regeer can run shit. I cannot. He can. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God he said he'd help me out. That's all I got to say. Thank you God. signed up before he did? Oh, yeah, I I'll signed up that. before oh, him, and then I'm like, Jesus. what do you mean? I got to pull. And then I'm, somebody, uh, I think it was Jamie McCowan, was like, hey, I think Robin Regeer is like interested in helping. I'm like, oh, my God. I couldn't call him fast enough. I was like, please, Reggie, please, like, by all means, like, your name. I don't care. He's like, oh, let's just co-chair it. I'm like, whoo. Thank God. <laughs> I mean, I haven't been in a meeting in four months. I, haven't been down. <laughs> I mean, that sounds oh. like your biggest win since 2006. Oh, huge win. Huge win. But it is a good tournament. I know yeah. because I'm involved it could be a little bit of a shit show, but you know what? It's a great tournament. Raises a bunch of money, moving. right? Raises a bunch of money for CP kids and family. We keep the golf tournament. I've done enough of these. The painful part is like eight hour rounds. And then after that, you got like a three hour dinner, which everybody hates so we keep it moving we got 36 holes to play with so the golf is like five hours for a scramble and then buffet dinner we keep it rolling so that's that's my contribution i know well what to avoid as far as tournament wise so it actually works out pretty good nice hopefully. so that's coming yeah. up later up uh in the month of may and uh man speaking yep. of uh speaking of flames alumni we've got one of the most iconic maybe the most iconic Flames alumni, uh, Hall of Famer, Stanley Cup champion, 500 goals to his name. Lanny McDonald will be dropping by the show coming up yes. in just a few minutes. Also, one of the all time great buttes in the history of the game and a good buddy of one Razor, Hal Gill Skillsy. What an apropos nickname for this guy, oh. Razor. No, oh, no, it's the best. It's the best. And then it fits him perfectly <laughs> off the I glass and out skills. I gotta say, like, I like his that. his road his road through the NHL. That guy may have the best stop collection of all time. Like that guy, anywhere you wanted to be, that guy pretty much stopped with Boston, Toronto, Montreal, like original six cities. Gets a cup in Pittsburgh, uh, and then settles down in Nashville. Like just a <laughs> phenomenal run. Uh, so we'll talk to Hal coming up in just a few minutes. Hey, look, the road to the Stanley Cup has been filled with action, upsets, goals galore. Clearest route to winning big is to play on Bodog.net. Bodog has you covered for all props, game lines, futures from now until the Stanley Cup final and beyond. Make your power play and score big with Bodog. Check the at Bodog CA Twitter page for details and how you can get up to $300 of free cash to play with right now. Now, reminder, everybody, hey, we are on YouTube if you're watching this. Uh, we're also on all Bodog social channels and Spotify now as well, so you can finally get us in audio form, finally. Uh, and we look much better in audio form as well, so much. be sure to tell yeah. a friend much. Um, <laughs> Razor, I'm glad you're in good spirits. I feel like this is a perfect place to start because, uh, man, oh, man, Boston. Um, what? The H-E <laughs> double hockey sticks happened in Beantown, my man. Oh boy. I mean, at the end of the day, all the analysts, any of the talking we can do, it, it has to start with choking. I, they choked. Um, there was nothing. We, we'll go through the lineup. We'll go through the goaltending. We'll go through all the issues, but 
This team led or were tied in all seven games in the third period. They had a lead with nine minutes left in game six. They had a lead with one minute and one second left in game seven on home ice. They choked. And, and that's, was, that's the most shocking thing. I didn't think this team had that in them. I did not think that I watched all year the historic third periods that they have, their ability to lock teams down. I, I, I did not think that it wouldn't translate. And, and it certainly didn't. And Florida, to their credit, and, and they're doing it against the Leafs as well now, they play a very simple game, and they have a lot of belief in going north-south. And, and they just continue to power through the Bruins' defense. They made the defense look really weak and, and caused so many turnovers that the Bruins just got rattled. And, and at the end of the day, it was, it was a bit of a choke. And um, it, it's, it, it was shocking because, again, I, I feel like I know hockey and seen enough hockey that – you know, these things, something translates, something doesn't. The way they play in the regular season all year long was not how they played in the playoffs. And it's just another another tale that we will be telling everyone next playoffs, first round, that playoffs, the game changes completely. Razor, I got a quick question because you're yeah. right there. Uh, do you think as the, I, I guess more like third period of game se- of game seven there and overtime, you think they were playing like I don't want to say scared, but like a little nervous? Would that yeah, be they fair? played. They were playing not to lose, right? Like yeah. that's what it looked like. It, it, the last the game six and seven, they played not to lose. They played really well in game five. Bobrovsky was incredible, forty-seven saves. Game six and seven, they played not to lose, and Florida was playing to win. And and it it like that six on five, like you talk, like they didn't even force. There was zero force. They had five guys in the slot, and they were letting Florida go around them. And and sooner or later, pucks go in. And then in overtime, I don't even think, did they even touch the puck in overtime? I, I don't even remember. Was I was clear. down in the glass. <laughs> it was it, it, it yeah. felt like Florida just breakaway, breakaway, and, and finally it went in. So, so no, they, they, they played not to lose, and, and that, that usually means death in the Stanley Cup playoffs. My only thought with Boston, the one thing that made me nervous going into the postseason was that everything, everything came up Boston for 82 games. Right. Like there, there mm-hmm. was just never any adversity. And I feel like you want a team that's tested a little bit. Right. And, and I guess you could make a case that, look, there were for all the question marks going into camp, you know, they really kind of <laughs> proved to be resilient and, and above and beyond any sort of wildest expectations for this franchise. But there just never seemed to be any adversity. Everything seemed to come easy for this team this year. That was the one thing that made me nervous. But Again, like it just seems so uncharacteristic for this team once, you know, you're up 3-1. That's the other thing, Andrew. Like you're up <laughs> three fucking one. Yeah, that's it. All these other times that this has happened, it was a sweep or Columbus smokes Tampa. Like just automatic yeah. game change. They had no chance. They're Right. They're up three to one. And, and they played really well in Florida games three and four. Like they were rolling. They were cooking. Yeah. All ever. And then Bergeron comes back and it, it they took a little bit off. They didn't take enough the, anything off the gas because, again, they had 50 shots in game five, but it felt like the coils and the Zakas of the world de- deferred a little bit, and, and they, they took a step back when Patrice came back in, and, and you hate to have it if it is the ending. The, for Patrice to lose his last three playoff games doesn't feel fitting, but that's hockey as well. That's that's the game. That's the business. And the adversity thing, I, I I was thinking of, you know, you expected that at some point, but I just thought they were so good that that's why they didn't have adversity. And that's why they weren't going to face it, especially in the first round yeah. against a Florida Panther team who gave up six goals every game. But again, it, it, the, the game changed enough and, and that momentum swung just enough in game five for for the, the Panthers to, to feel good and, and the Bruins to get real, real tight. I had a good friend of mine who's a diehard Bruins fan and he was after game, you know, goalie should have gone with the, you know, should have gone to Swayman sooner. I mean, look, you've been there, you've lived it, you've breathed it. You know, is there a shoulda, coulda, woulda? I mean, we, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback now, but. Yeah. And believe me, that's basically all I've been doing for two weeks. I, I don't <laughs> think, uh, you know, that question's been been asked of me. At least me. you're getting paid this yeah. time. Yeah, 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 that's well. That's that's remains to be seen as well. Um, <laughs> it's I don't. So, Kami, Kami can answer this question. I, you know what? I, I'll 
I'll put it in a place, but I'd like Kami to talk on this too, because I don't see how you make the change. You're up three to one, you're coming home. You're not changing, you're not changing the goaltender then. The guy just made played great on the road twice. Four goals on 74 shots in those two games. Comes back home. He's the Vesna Trophy winner. I'll add to that. He has to play game five. You're closing them out. That's it. The series is over. They have he's lost two games on home ice. Game six. Okay, let's look at game six. Your Vesna Trophy makes a bad play in overtime, gives the puck away. Don't you want to go back to that guy in game six at that point? You're still up three to two going on the road. My hindsight is 2020 move is taking him out at some point in game six. It started getting chaotic in that game. The Bruins were turning it over. Florida was turning it over. Pucks were going everywhere and everything that was shot was going in the net. And it wasn't the goaltender's fault. It was one of those games. I, in hindsight, and I wouldn't have done it at the time, but when you're up four to three and you give up another one to go four, four, maybe that's the time. All right, maybe we've been the best third period team all year. We're on the road. Swim and get in there just so everyone gets their attention and say, Hey, enough, like get the pucks out, make it easy on our goaltender. Quit playing the running gun. That was such a screwball game, right? Like it was nuts. And, And maybe pulling him there settles your best historic team down just enough or gets their attention. It's a tough play. Uh, but that is where my hindsight comes in. Game seven, you're, 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 you don't have a good decision at that point because if you put Allmark in, which which I would have done, um, you risk him being rattled. You put Swayman in, you're risking a rusty goal going in in the first period, which it did. I thought he battled through it and played great, but he wasn't really well prepared for that start in game seven. So I, I would love to hear Kami, what you, you know, when are you going to pull a goal and when as a defenseman or as a player, you're like, wow, this guy needs to get out. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I'll agree with what you say when that with that game in game six, uh, I was kind of checking in and out of it. Like I I was at the bar and I'm like, I turned my head for a second. I'm like, oh my God, there's two more goals. What is going on? (laughs) How am I missing all these goals? They're scoring like 15 of them. But like you said, like in hindsight, it's I I would agree with you. Get them out of there because the game was, you know, but to do that during the game would be Yeah, in a one goal game. That's in a one goal game. Yeah, and he's been your guy all year. Like that's, that it, it seems like it's real easy to say now. It, it, during during as it's going on, that would be very hard. But Kami, um, do you know? Do you know as a defender? I, I guess to to further to what Andrew's kind of point is, do you know as a defender or as somebody who's playing in front of their goalie, do you know when when your guy's buckling or do you know when they don't have it? I'd say it goes both ways, though. Yeah, yeah, you would have an idea. I mean, you know if some bad rebounds maybe, or you know, obviously some, you know, weaker goals, but also I, I do think there's value in, you know, c- coming from a, a defenseman's point of view, like, let's say like the goalie's playing just fine, but goals are going in. Cause I mean, like I said, if I'm the defenseman, if I keep giving up great, great a chances sooner or later, those are going to start going in. I do also think there's some value of like, if I was a coach of getting the goalie out and switching the goalie as like a message, I always know, like, when the backup goalie came in, you know, I even if you, as a decor and as a team, I think in general, you're like, hey, look, we got to get it together here. We got the backup guy in here now. We got, we need to play better. Like, we need to be solid in front of them. And that can kind of bring things together a little bit. So I think, I do definitely think there's some value in that. I don't think it's always, it's not always the goalie's fault for sure. Um, but yeah, that, that was, I feel like a lot of that, like we, like we touched on, it's, it's easy to say now when you're in it that's pretty tough calls especially after a season where pretty much everything has gone your way and so yeah that's that's tough to kind of uh... and, and i think that's like what we t- when we talk adversity like i think that's where it's hardest for the coaches it's hard to make because at some point when everything's going bad you make really tough kind of wild decisions where John Cooper sits, his, you know, stamp goes down for the third period, right? All kinds of things. Paul Maurice calls his team out in Toronto after Kachuk's dad already called them all out. Like, that's really uncomfortable and you have to make, and that's what, that's where the adversity, I don't think it was as much for the players, but for the coaching staffs, it makes it hard to make tough decisions because you want to go with the guys that you, that got you there over and over again, but you haven't had it out in certain situations 
and you can't call guys out come playoff time. And, and that, that came crystal clear watching this series and, and, and having a couple weeks looking back on it. That's where it really makes it difficult when these teams are great and these president's trophy teams get into the playoffs. I think coaching is the hardest part of that because you haven't had the FUs with 90 year players throughout the season. It's only one or two guys. And that's just not enough come playoff time when you're doing it every single day. Yeah. Yeah. That's sure. a really good point. Yeah. But you're gonna There's run no chance Jim Montgomery had to get into anything. I mean, 65 wins. I mean, yeah. just showing yeah. up and just cruise control. Just well, that's the thing. Yeah. You guys, you guys are playing great. Keep it going. Nobody's getting fired here, right? Like you got a Vesna trophy. No. Winner. You got a coach no. of the year. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was hard to argue. Everybody loved the moves that, you know, that Sweeney made, right? And to go to push all the chips in. I mean, this team was kind of built what we were seeing to go the distance, but I guess it'll be interesting. Time. I think it'll yeah. be interesting to see what happens. I mean, I mean, I know there's some question marks about who's coming back and Bergeron and stuff like that, but if by and large, if they run it back, it'll be interesting to see how next year goes just because, you know, and, and go back to the last time somebody won over 60 games there, Tampa. Tampa won 62 games. Columbus kicked their ass in the first round for, I think it was Columbus's first series whenever. If it wasn't number one, it was number two, but that doesn't, doesn't really matter. And then from that point forward, they came back the next year and they've been to the finals three times in a row. So I know it's a different team and everything, but it'll be interesting to see how they come back from this next year. I'll be interested to watch that. We uh, we touched on it last uh, the last episode, but obviously more fallout since as we shift to Calgary here, Kami. Oh um, boy, Daryl Sutter's <laughs> out. I mean, I, I just I'm trying to figure out like how this how did this all play out because if there was clearly a disconnect between Sutter and Treliving, uh, how is Sutter out now after Treliving was gone? Right, uh, you know, you've got the GM who mutually parts ways. Said, you know what, we're good. We're good. And and now Sutter's gone with, you know, a ton of money owed to him on a contract extension that he was given last year. So what the pretty, hell? Pretty good move, Daryl. Yeah. Oh my yeah, good for yeah. Daryl. I mean, good for yeah, Daryl. Great for Daryl. Daryl's yeah. back to farming with eight million bucks coming his way. America. <laughs> so Daryl's looking good. Um, yeah. I mean, full disclosure. Obviously, I paid attention. Uh, the only chat I had about it is after well, Brett. Brad, I just sent Trilliving a text being like, hey, man, I thought you did a good job. You know, anyways, just, I'll talk to you once the dust settles, blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, from the outside looking in, he didn't want to come back. Brad just said, you know what? I'm good. I mean, that's a – I mean, GM of the Calgary Flames, he's been there. He enjoyed it. It's a – I mean, it's, a, you're, it's an NHL general managing job. I mean, it's a great job. And he just straight up said, you know what? I'm good. Um, so – I mean, you have to think there was some kind of disconnect between Daryl and Brad. You know, I I heard rumors. I don't know if this is true, but I'd heard rumors that Daryl, just for his contract extension, just went right over Brad and just went right to Murray Edwards. Mm -hmm. If I was a general manager, I'd probably be a little bit pissed off at that. If I'm just completely cut out of the cut out of that part of it, yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's a big step that I think he should be making that decision. But absolutely. Um, if that did in fact happen, then I could see why Brad would be upset. Um, but yeah, so Brad just straight up says, I'm good. No, thank you. Somebody else can take this. And then I hit, and then whatever it was, two, three weeks later, Daryl gets canned. I think what ended up happening is Maloney, the president, from what I read and heard a little bit, I mean, he basically went around and talked to players. He talked to training staff he talked to front office he i think he interviewed like 34 35 40 people that are whatever day to day right in there with the flames and by the result i'm guessing that there wasn't really a whole lot of questions that the result of those interviews uh was daryl has to go not a lot and of team daryl <laughs> i don't think there was a whole lot of daryl uh team daryl pom-poms being uh fired around and yeah, Daryl's gone. And so obviously it must've been, I mean, you owe the guy 8 million bucks still. You got no general manager. I mean, it must've been a, it must've been a resounding no, no, we're not doing, I mean, you, you know, you read stuff online where 
you know, players aren't going to come back. And I mean, I'm not sure how that works. I mean, that's, that seems like a little <laughs> bit of a bluff to me, but obviously whatever they told him was enough for Maloney to be like, we have no chance of success if we run Daryl back. Um, so yeah, interesting times in Calgary. The same thing here though, a little for a completely different reason than Boston. But I mean, I do think overall the flames have a, a I think they have a pretty good team. I mean, we liked them at the beginning of the year. They set all kinds of records, overtime losses. I mean, we were laughing about it a couple uh, episodes ago where it's like hit posts and all this stuff. Every every record you don't want to have, they were like picking it up. And and some of that, I'm sure, was bad luck. Um, so we'll see who they hire. I mean, I, I have no idea. Hopefully, there's only one guy. I really hope they don't hire. And I know <laughs> this dude. Babs is sniffing around this guy. Oh, he, says, he wants that one. Oh, he wants, he wants he that wants one him. so and, bad. Oh. Uh, I mean, I have to move. That's, I'm done that's with the a, alumni. If that no, happens, no, you got to roll. You got to roll. Like, oh. that, that's the, as soon as that comes up, you say, we just fired that guy. We literally yeah. just fired that guy. We're not bringing yeah. another one of those guys in. Yeah. Big time. Hubie, Hubie will have a heart attack. He'll drive oh, his boy. Ferrari right, right back to Florida and <laughs> retire. Well, I mean, I would just say, look, look, whatever the case, like from a general manager standpoint, you're in a slippery slope because you've got an aging core, right? With, I mean, look at it. I mean, Hubert O's, you've just signed him to an 80, what, oh, plus man. million dollar deal. And he's th- he's turning 30 in a couple of weeks. You've got to reignite Manjapani as well. But Markstrom's 33. You know, the list goes on. Toffoli's in his 30s. You know, Backlund's in his 30s. You know, it, the list goes on and on with all Kadri. these guys. You know, Kadri is in his 30s, right? And, and at the same time, You've got to find a coach that can ultimately reignite these guys who were your offensive threats who've absolutely cratered over the last year. So, well, I think a lot of people are trying to shake their heads or most parts of Canada, if you're not in Toronto, are celebrating over what was thought to be like a Stanley Cup path turns into an epic disaster after exercising one demon Turns out all those demons have just basically took about a half hour nap uh, as the Leafs flame out against the Florida Panthers. Razor, let's start with you. You're the former Leaf here, but man, what happened to this team? Well, it's so funny, right? Because the the meme used to be the one where the Maple Leaf Square, whatever they call where all the people are, and 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 they score and everyone walks out, right? Like everyone's depressed. Now the meme is the the we want Florida meme is going to live <laughs> infamously forever, Ugh. and and maybe they should get rid of that square and and put that thing to rest because certainly no good karma is coming out of it for the Leafs. I I, I think. I think a couple things. Number one is I, I think that th- winning one round in that, in that area, I, I do think there was a letdown. I think there was a little bit of a, a sigh of relief. Mm-hmm. And I think you saw it with the entire city, but I, I think that had to have carried over into the guys a little bit. I think the Bruins getting knocked out by Florida made it worse because they really did look at this as, oh, you know, this is Trump change now. Uh, yeah, Florida got lucky beating the Bruins. The Bruins didn't face adversity all year. Florida's really not that good. We're going to destroy these guys. And between those two factors, I, I think that they battled at the end and they were close games, but I don't think they had their complete focus when it was necessary in the first two games, especially at home. And then for that matter, game three, when you go down three, nothing, you're just, no matter what happens, you, you, you're you in a really tough spot. So between the, the, the excitement of winning one round and not really having the real eye on the prize at the end of the day. And then the fact that it was Florida and not Boston, I think really contributed to the second round for the Leafs. Kami. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, I think you view it as if Boston would have got through the Leafs win the first round and the Bruins beat Boston. I think you sit there and look at it. By and large, hey, look, we we had a good year. We got out of the first round. This is we're improving. Things are moving forward. We'll take the next step the next year. With Boston losing to Florida and these things kind of lining up, and they t- Toronto gets out of the first round, beats Tampa. Now all of a sudden it's like whoa, like the path is open here. It just got a little bit quote unquote easier, and then for them to. You know, like you said, the we want Florida things. He starts maybe looking ahead a little bit. I do think there's a lot of value in 
I mean, how nervous would those guys have been for that first round? Like you had to get out of that first round. You lose that first round again. It's a total blow everything up, this and that. But with Boston getting knocked out and things kind of seeming the path getting slightly easier and for them to show up and basically, you know, get handed their lunch a little bit by Florida, that is disappointing. Um, so, yeah, I mean... I want to say the years of success. If the if it would have been the Bruins beat them out, I'd say the years of success. Uh, and I still think it's a success, but I don't know. I don't know if very very many people are going to be satisfied just I, I because. How do, you, how do you how do you quantify success for a team that's seen to be a Stanley Cup contender to win one round? Right, like I yeah. just don't understand. I just don't understand how that can be deemed a success when you're expected to win a Stanley Cup. Yes, I granted it's nice to kind of exercise a demon and and win a round, but this team was not built to win a round, right? This True. team was built to go, you know, to the Stanley Cup final, right? They they made the trade, they made the move to bring in Ryan O'Reilly to help augment this core, to bring in more grit, to bring in that leadership and that experience. But I mean, to me, it's fascinating. Razor, I think you really alluded to something, and I totally subscribe to the theory. I think one letter separates the difference between Florida and Toronto in that series. And the Leafs, when they beat Tampa, it was relief for Florida. When they beat the Bruins, it was belief, right? Yeah. It was, you know, one took a breath. One was like, we can do this. And you look at Florida last year. I mean, they ran away with the president's trophy, right? Like that was a, that was a team that was good. They get bounced in the second round. They make a franchise altering trade and they're better for it. And there's already a lot of sandpaper. There's already a lot of skill with that roster and a lot of speed. And you're seeing it. And you've got a goalie who's finally played up to the, the financial expectations, right? But this Leafs team, to me, I think everything's got to be on the table. Like, you cannot, you can absolutely not run it back. I mean, there's going to be, you know, outside of that core, you cannot keep that core intact any longer. You've, you've run it back how many years? You're on the clock now with Matthews for one more year. You got one more year with Nylander before both of those hit unrestricted free agency. You got two with Marner and Tavares. I mean, they're on the clock. Everything's got to be on the table. I don't see, like, you've obviously tried it with Sheldon Keefe for the last how many years? I think, you know, Kyle Dubas, I mean, look, I, I like Kyle. I, I like Kyle as a person, and he's obviously put together some very competitive regular season teams, but... I think it might be time for a fresh set of eyes because, look, you have gone all in with this core. This is what you believed in. You have put your name on it. And it didn't work. After how many years? Seven years with this group. Relief and belief. I am stealing that one, Seaball. That was uh, that was a really was good brilliant. line. I like that one a lot. That'll be used. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not sure this is a... I think what we're seeing is that it actually isn't a Stanley Cup contender. And they built this team, but you can't build it teams this way. You look at the Carolina Hurricanes and how they're built. A bunch of B-pluses. You, you, yeah. you can't expect this core. And, and I was, you know, okay, the core, yeah, they're not scoring goals. There's no team in the National Hockey League Stanley Cup playoffs that have ever had five guys score five goals in one round. It can't happen. It just physically, there's not enough goals to go around. There's not enough pucks to go around for four or five guys to be ones that have to carry you and have to score three goals every three games to be looked upon as productive and successful. So when you have a Nylander, Matthews, Marner that really only survive in this league by getting points, makes it very difficult to expect that from them come Stanley Cup playoff time because there's just not enough points to go around and you're always going to look at one of those, if not two or three of them like we're doing now, in saying they didn't do enough offensively. Well, you, you can't build a team like that. You need people around them to to, to lift them up, the Martunics of the world to lift guys up. Yep. And I think that at the end of the day, that 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 foundation that they have has to change because it's just not sustainable. You just can't win over a long period of time in the Stanley cup playoffs with guys trying that, that only value themselves with points. Tommy, would you agree with that assessment? I mean, you've won, you've won and you've been to another cup final. Like, I mean, you went, you went with teams like role players, grinders, well, the yeah. Leafs, like they've got the Leafs have five guys and then everything's a moving part to kind of what Andrew's alluding to. Yeah, most of the money is going to those four or five guys or whatever it is. Yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with that. I mean, just going on the, my two experiences. I mean, in Calgary, 
I mean, if one of those guys is a really hot goaltender, I really like that more than offense. I'll take the sure, goalie yeah. every day. Yeah. But yeah, we went with basically role players, you know, uh, maybe a star or two, if you want to call it that, but basically role players. And yeah, you had yeah, one you're franchise right. player up front and you had a, fr- and a, a red hot and franchise, a red hot franchise back, goalie. Right? Yeah. And in Carolina, it was sure. We, we had some bigger name guys, but they were kind of, Either Older. young, like your well, you yeah, both. It was you know you had yeah, your yeah. Justin Williams Brindam- and you had your Brindam- Eric at the Stahl. end, all and- yeah, yeah. Well, and well, you I had just said- and your Stillmans and your Ray yeah, Whitney's to, and guys like give- that, but none of those guys are A plus. Yeah. To give what Commie some is. love here too, we just talked to Hal Gill. It's to say like, the, who's the Hal Gill, the Mike Commodore of, of these teams? That it, it's a it's a, a very important thing, and, and that's why those guys, you guys. We talk to and have rings and have gone to not just one final. You've yeah. gone to two finals. Skills has gone to two. You need mm-hmm. guy. That's where you win cups with those guys. Those guys from there. And I, I you know, I know you're not that guy. You're brag, bragging about it, but I think that's important to point out. Like you, you guys, the players are, are really respected with what you guys do. And I think all guys that have played and have had any kind of experience with the Stanley Cup playoffs no that's who wins you cups as much as and thank you as much as you know we focus on you know people tend to focus on like offense and numbers and that's the sexy stuff you need guys both for on the forward and the back end you need guys that eat up the shitty minutes that Mm -hmm. kill the penalties and that are grinding it out and are playing good defensively and getting the puck out moving the puck forward as nice as it is to grab the puck, go end to end and do all that stuff, the playoffs, that gets a whole lot harder. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you need dudes that eat the shitty minutes. I will say that for sure. Now we wait and watch the offseason unfold, and I am all here for the chaos. And- <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> We're all giggling. Because, I mean, no, look. I mean, it's yes, it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, look, a Leaf Stanley Cup playoff run will be epic, I think, for, for the journey, but it is kind of funny to watch. <laughs> I mean, sorry, not sorry. I, I love the Leafs. No Babs, I love the Leafs. But yeah, I mean, it is it is more entertaining. Yeah, that's true. Everybody <laughs> loves a train wreck. That's right. Hey, listen, we're going to take a quick pause for the cause. We got a lot more we want to get to. In fact, the Hall of Famer himself, the greatest duster in hockey history, Lanny McDonald, joins us next right here on the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net. The Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net continues, and we are joined by hockey royalty. He might be the Sam Elliott of the hockey universe, <laughs> at least the greatest duster in hockey history. He is a Hall of Famer, 500 goals in the National Hockey League, Stanley Cup winner, and one awesome human being off the ice as well. Lanny McDonald. How are you, Lanny? I am doing great. Uh, so great uh, that I got the invite from Kami to come on board. This, this was exciting. Like I couldn't <laughs> sleep last night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on now, Lanny. <laughs> you guys have uh, got, you guys have put some time in together, Kami. Yeah, yeah. We you know we could start out with that. Yeah, Lanny and I. Uh, I spent some time in Calgary. Lanny's in and out of there too. And um, yeah, Lanny's a major part um, for for people that don't come to Calgary. The Calgary Flames alumni is one of the better ones I would say in the league as far as like getting involved in the community. And the 89 team, and especially Lanny, and, and a lot of other guys on the team there too, Colin Patterson, McCowan, Mers, and a bunch of the guys are really involved in the community, and some of us younger guys are trying to get there. And um, Yeah, you speak to what you were doing there yesterday, Lanny, with the McHappy days or something like that? Yeah, McHappy day. Uh, uh, I got asked probably uh, three months ago to come back on board. 40 years ago, I... Uh, uh, my dear wife, Ardell, and I were honorary chairman when they built... Ronald McDonald House in the first place. McHappy Day, all the funds go to Ronald McDonald House. They're expanding the house from 27 rooms to 90 rooms starting in June. And so it was fun being out there and letting people know what's going on. And uh, you're absolutely right. Our alumni in Calgary is awesome. Uh, And to have nine guys from the Stanley Cup team uh, still live in the city is, is wonderful. Kami didn't say that he has taken over uh, with Robin Regeer, the, 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 our alumni golf tournament. Uh, Kami is the face, and Robin is uh, the money man behind it. it. It works absolutely perfectly. 
Yeah, we talked about it a little bit before you came on. I, I was just telling these guys that, it, well, I don't know if I'm the face of it. Robin's definitely the brains, the organization, everything behind it. I was saying earlier, thank God Robin decided to co-chair it. Otherwise, this tournament would be a massive, massive trouble. No, you know what? Uh, Kami, it's wonderful to have you on board. Uh, Dana Merzen did it for like 23, 24 years. And to have these young guys, okay, Kami, young guys, uh, <laughs> jump in and, and take it over and be a part of it uh, is fabulous. And that's just coming up uh, 24th of May, 24th yep. and 25th of May. And hope to raise, uh, Kami, what, another 150, 175,000? Yeah. Uh, which all goes right back into uh, different charities in the community. It's awesome. You yeah. mentioned all those alumni guys that are that are still in Calgary. It's funny we we had G Doug Gilmore on this show a few months ago, and and I think Razor and Kami, I think all of us were just just blown away just how stacked that eighty nine roster was, Lanny. Like it's just crazy well, how good that team was. Well, they it was good, and it was so much fun to be a part of it. And when you think about a guy like Joe Newendike who won three Stanley Cups with three different teams, uh, being really the second center iceman on that uh, team. Uh, yeah, but Dougie Gilmore won, won A uh, with Newey. It, it was unbelievable and so much fun to be a part of it and be the only team to ever win in Montreal. Uh, that was kind of icing on the cake. We didn't care where we won. We just wanted to win. Well, that, was, bring, that was heartbreaking ahead, for a nine-year-old Andrew Raycroft, by the way. Oh. Like, I, I, I don't know if I've <laughs> forgiven you still. To, to actually have won that on form ice and beat Patrick Well, I cried for weeks in Belleville, Ontario. Over that. Really, well, it, but listen, I'll never forget it. Me. You just killed me when you said you're nine years old. Nah, I well, I'm old too. <laughs> Call like, me that that was called for. I know. Uh, I apologize. Uh, I but uh, so so much fun uh, uh, back then. Well, anytime you win it, uh, right, Call me. Uh, uh, it doesn't get better than that. And those guys are are friends for life. We spend a lot of time uh, together. Uh, there's a an event tonight with Colin Patterson breaking free. It's also a shout out to Colin Patterson, Colin's birthday today. Oh, I can't tell you. I can't hey. tell you how old he is, but whoo, he's getting up there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lanny, take a, take me back to like, um, I was reading a little bit today and <laughs> we do a bunch of events here, but when you got traded to Calgary from Colorado, like were you, I know you were going home, but were you fired up for it? Did you, do did you see it coming? No, as, as a matter of fact, I had a separated shoulder. We were on a, a two-week uh, road trip, and they played the night before in Vancouver. I didn't play. Coming back to Calgary, we played uh, in Calgary. I think we got beat 9-2 to two, oh. uh, in Calgary and head to Winnipeg for the game the next day. And uh, I get off the plane in Winnipeg, and uh, Marshall... Uh, Johnson uh, was the assistant coach. He calls me over and says, Lanny, you're going back to Calgary. And I said, like, is it my mom, my dad? Like, what's going on? Is somebody yeah. uh, sick? No, no, we traded. I called him every name in the book. I had him <laughs> up against the wall. Uh, uh, Rob Ramage and Steve Tambellini were grabbing me, pulling me off my kitchen. And, and Marshall said, wasn't a small guy. No, but I was so <laughs> mad because you, your first thought when you get traded is they don't want you anymore. And then you think about it for a second and you realize, oh, that's a whole lot better than the Colorado Rockies. Uh, but I was still worried going back close to home. Uh, I shouldn't have worried. They took me in like a long lost son and it couldn't have worked out better. You were there in Colorado with grapes as well, right? Is there a, is there I, a is there a cherry story that comes to mind? Oh my God, M my <laughs> all time favorite. Well, I have I have probably a hundred grape stories, <laughs> but my all time favorite was we were playing New York uh, Rangers, and the morning of the, the game, this and Blue always sat right outside uh, uh, Grapes's office, and when you came in. Uh, Graves's office was on the right of the dressing room and you turned to the left and 
the whole dressing room opened up to everybody. And everyone knew, like you walk slowly going past Blue. And this reporter comes in, he races in, runs right past Blue, who wants to get his story for the day. And Blue jumps up, races after him, grabs him by the pant leg, pulls him down. We're all yelling for Grapes to get in there. Grapes comes <laughs> into the room and Grapes doesn't even help the guy. He said, see that? That's what I want you guys like tonight. Hungry. Just like Blue. <laughs> well, then... Then he finally helps uh, get the guy back up on his feet. The guy doesn't even get a story. He runs out of the room. He's <laughs> he's panicked. He's oh petrified. My. It was hilarious. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Blew the dog. Oh man, that's amazing. The yeah. uh, I you know it's it's funny though, guys. Like we you are defined as a Calgary Flame. I, I think in in hockey universes and. You know, as much as it made Razor cry, to me, one of the as as much as I was an Oiler fan as a kid, Lanny, oh, you know, to me, one of the most iconic images Sorry, in the history of the sport was you hoisting that Stanley Cup um, when you had that moment. And, you know, to kind of think back, though, there's a generation of Leaf fans and you talk about the center of the universe in Toronto that remember you fondly. And it's almost it feels forgotten in some hockey circles, but Man, that Leafs team in the late 70s, you, I mean, I, I'm looking at this roster. It's like you, Sittler, Paul Mateer, Salming. I, I mean, you know, we just lost Borey not too long ago, but my goodness, Tiger Williams, like the personalities, the talent, the skill. That's the one that I, I think you talk about. There's a certain vintage of Leaf fans that look back and say, that's the group that should have won. As much as people talk about 93 with Dougie and all of it, like that's the group that should have won in the late 70s. Like what a roster you had. You know, it was really sad. In 78, we lost to the Montreal Canadiens. They go on, win the Stanley Cup. Uh, the very next year, uh, we lose. Uh, we lost the first year in semifinals, lost in the quarterfinals to Montreal the very next year uh, in four games. But they were all close games. Uh, I think two went into overtime. One was a one nothing game. And then... Uh, uh, sadly, uh, Roger Nielsen and Jim Gregory both got fired, and in comes Floyd Smith uh, and Punch Imlac, and they literally destroyed that team in one year. I think 13 guys were gone at the end of that year, and instead of, he wanted to put his stamp on the team, and instead of just tweaking it, because we knew we were close, uh, they just tore that team apart, and it was so sad. And a guy like Daryl, uh, and I'm speaking of Sittler, should have never worn any other jersey than the Toronto Maple Leafs. Mm -hmm. But that sadly didn't happen. And yeah, it took them a long time to recover. And holy my God, 1967, you go th back that far. When Dougie Gilmore came in uh, with Cliff Fletcher at the helm, they made it close. But not quite close enough and hopefully this team uh, that is playing right now can find a way to win three in a row here they've already got one if they can ever snap them in the next game all the pressure goes back to florida and that would be so much fun to watch mm -hmm. oh it would be heck of a comment go coming yeah i was gonna yeah to touch on that just what you said there um so when they blew the team up there, traded Settler and ended up trading you, that was all just because of a guy coming in wanting to just put his own stamp on the team, in your opinion? Ballard. Yeah, that, that was Punch Imlac. And okay. uh, it, we were at a summer event, uh, golf tournament uh, in Toronto, and and uh, Gilbert Pearl was there. And uh, that's where Punch came from, from Buffalo. And Gilbert said, oh, my gosh, uh, like, Buckle up, boys. You guys are in trouble because Punch will try and destroy everything you guys have built. And that's exactly what happened. When I got traded, I, I always regretted one thing. Uh, I got called into the coach's office and Punch was there all by himself. And he, he wouldn't tell me where I got traded. He wouldn't tell me who I got traded with or, or where I was going. He said, you'll find out soon enough. He sticks out his hand to wish me good luck. And I should have drilled him right there. We were the only two guys in the room. And no one would have known. Nobody and would have known. I, 
I didn't. And I go outside, ask the reporters, you know where I'm going? They said, Colorado. Is someone going with me? And they said, yeah, Joel Quinville. So I said, give me a half second. I went into the room. Joel had no idea. Punch had gone back upstairs. And I was the guy that told Joel, we're going together to Colorado. It was the oh, wow. stupidest thing you could have possibly imagined. And after that, I think Pat Boudet was the first guy, then ourselves, uh, then Tiger and Jerry Butler went to uh, Vancouver. Daryl went to Philly and it just kept going. Dave Hutchison went to LA. Uh, it was a disaster. Uh, punch is an asshole. But there's a, <laughs> but, but, you know, oh, totally Jesus. right. But, but oh you my look God. at but you look at you know there's there's that sort of emotion when you're so close and it's you know you sometimes you you know have fans that say oh, okay well you know blow it up right and it's like be careful what you wish for right yeah. as opposed to making a few tweaks and you know we were a few minutes ago we were talking about Boston Air Racer and and you know what do you do with a team that flamed out obviously in in round one but you know you don't need open heart surgery with that roster which they clearly decided to you know augment you know i mean they completely ruined it what was a really good thing lanny well it, it really was into what did they lose eight games all year and then to lose the last three the way they did yeah uh it was it was sad but everyone's uh nhl bracket got blown up with colorado <laughs> uh them tampa bay uh all losing in that first round I, I'm not sure anyone actually is batting 100% at this point. Hey, we should have picked the Florida Kraken final. We were looking pretty good right now. <laughs> oh, you <laughs> didn't see you that. Be making, you'd, you'd be, be making, making some big money. Oh, Let, yeah. Hey, hey Lanny, Lanny, really quickly, just uh, on that Leafs group, I was just fascinated to kind of see how many head coaches came from that that 78 team. You, you, well, mentioned, it, you mentioned Quenville, but Bruce Boudreaux, Ron Wilson, Randy Carlisle, John Anderson. Dan Maloney, you know, all under the oh, wow. sort of Roger Nielsen. Yeah, I know it's crazy, guys. Like I didn't know that. This is all under the Roger Nielsen coaching yep. tree, right? And, and I think you just touched on it. Roger taught everyone so much about the game. He was so far ahead of uh, uh, all the other coaches. And when Scotty coached against Roger when we played Montreal uh, or when he was in St. Louis, it was a cat and mouse game like you would not believe one trying to outdo the other uh, because Roger was kind of a pupil of how Scotty coached. And Roger, we loved it. I, I, I feel like one of the luckiest guys because I had Roger Nielsen and then later uh, Bob Johnson, two uh, guys that were way ahead of their, their time. But that, that time in Toronto... And all those guys that ended up coaching, I kind of chuckle. Like, uh, I'm good, not good friends, but friends with uh, Bruce Boudreaux. He was the last guy <laughs> I would have <laughs> ever thought was going to coach in the NHL. Uh, and let well, alone that a, many games, right? <laughs> oh, oh my God, what a career he's ended up having, uh, regardless. And it's hilarious. He doesn't care if he's only out of work one day. And he gets an offer, whether it's on uh, in the NHL or on radio or TV, he's there. Uh, like he just loves the game. And that's what it comes down to. Lanny, one question about 1978. I read this earlier. Yep. You scored the uh, you scored the series winner. Did you have two broken wrists and a broken nose? I had Is a broken nose, broken nose and broken wrist. Uh, thanks to uh, Denny Potvin and Burt Wilson. Burt Wilson in L.A. in the first series yeah, uh, broke my nose. I put a cage on, took it off in game three, and Dave Lewis broke my nose again. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and put the cage put the cage back on. Uh, they froze my wrist, taped it up solid. And, hey, that's old-time hockey. You know that. Yeah, no oh, kidding. no, you were too young. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't know <laughs> that, Lanny. I'm not on your level. You yeah, don't know that. <laughs> that whole panel is way too young to even understand that old-time <laughs> hockey. <laughs> way too young. I have my Hall of Fame jersey behind me. I had I was pumped to go up there a few right before COVID and spent the weekend with you, Lanny. And uh, yeah. what a great, great event for a guy like me to be playing the honorary game um, and get puck shot at me. But 
I, I'm fascinated and would love to hear some Hall of Fame stories. Being chairman of the board is a really big job and a real honor. I'm curious how you how you got that position and then how the something that came out of it because that that's that's a big deal. And um to have that kind of responsibility must have been is, is interesting to me. Well, it, it was such an honor. First of all, I was uh, uh, on the selection committee for nine years and Pat Quinn had just taken over as chairman from Bill Hay. Uh, and Pat sadly passed away a year and a half later. And they asked if I would put my name forward, step down from the selection committee and put my name forward to uh, be chairman of the hall. Well, if you love the game and love the history of the game, like you're like a kid in a candy shop, like it is so much fun. And having people like yourself come in and play that Hall of Fame game, uh, you rub shoulders with a guy, a lot of guys that uh, you either admired or went to war either with or against. And to be able to make those calls uh, after the meetings are over in June, is so much fun. Uh, and I know now what Santa Claus feels like. You, you pick up the phone, and one of my all time favorites was uh, Rogi Vashon. Waited 37 years to make it to the hall. And his dear wife kept telling him all the time, You're going to get the call. You're going to get the call. Don't worry. And sadly, she passed away the year before. And we call Rogi. And Rogi thinks it's really like we're pranking him. And yeah, I had to had to explain, no, Rogi, this is the real thing. Like, and he, he said, Oh my God. I said, Rogi, what, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to grab the biggest, fattest cigar, and I'm taking my dogs for a walk, and I'm not coming back till that cigar is gone. <laughs> and, and it was just beautiful. Uh, but to to be able to make those calls uh, and to be a part of of the Hockey Hall of Fame in the first place, uh, I'm I'm feel like the luckiest guy to have a career in hockey and then have another one. I worked in the oil and gas uh, business for 15 years before being asked to take over as chairman, and what a what a cool position to have. I wouldn't trade it. Uh, you got two five-year terms. I'm already in year seven, and it's gone way too fast. Lanny, does it get heated? Uh, the, it, the, the different uh, discussions? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, absolutely. When, when you think, uh, you, you look up the 18 people on the selection committee, and I don't get a vote. I, I just uh, kind of manage the meeting along with okay. Mike Gardner, who is chairman of the selection committee. And every once in a while, you have to jump in and get guys to, okay, back off just a little bit here. Okay, take a breath. Uh, <laughs> but the discussions, that's the way it should be. You, you, you have people uh, that you believe deserve, uh, should be in the hall. And to get there, you need 14 of 18 votes. And people think, oh, that's, that's pretty easy. No, that that's like 75% of the votes and it's tough. Uh, but the people that are in there and it should be tough. It's the Hockey Hall of Fame and the people that are in there, they richly deserve it. Absolutely. Um, I, I want to say maybe in closing from my standpoint, I mean, that moment when you finally hoist the Stanley Cup, Lanny, you know, the more I think about it, it's like, man, that must have been well worth the wait, considering that your playing career got sta sandwiched in where three of the greatest dynasties in hockey history <laughs> kind of ruled the roost. Right. I mean, that yep. Montreal, that Montreal group in the 70s. And Andrew, you've, you've heard a lot about Montreal conversation over the last few weeks with Boston chasing history with the 65 wins. But, you know, those, that Montreal team in the late 70s. Then you've got, then you go right to the Islanders that you had to deal with when you're playing in Toronto as well. And then the whole battle of Alberta, as good as you were, we talked about that 89 roster being stacked, but what you had to deal with, with the Gretzky and Messier Oilers of the eighties. Tell me this of those dynasties that you had to face off against all built extremely differently, which was the best of the three. 
I don't know if you can actually say which is the best of the three. The Battle of, of Alberta, as Kami will tell you, there is nothing like it. Like, strap them on, boys, because yeah. it's going to be an all-out war. And that's the way it should be. Like, it's bragging rights for the, for the province. It goes head-to-head -head with, uh, with football, with politics, with hockey. And we loved it. But that team in Montreal, they beat us in 86 uh, when we thought, oh, my gosh, we're going right back the next year. And it took us three more years to find a way to get back there. And thank goodness, Montreal wins in 86. We win in 89. Uh, couldn't have, in my opinion, worked out better uh, for, for everyone in, in Calgary to have one more chance against a stacked team like that. And then you do, date all the way back to uh, uh, the mid uh, to late seventies. That Islander team, like you talk about stacked, like it was <laughs> it was sick. Murderous how big, how cold. strong! Uh, what a great coach, uh, L. Arbor and Bill Torrey. What a team they they were together. So yeah, they they were all different. But uh, if you couldn't get up for those games, get out of the game. Period. Amen. Amen. Thanks for this. Perfect. Thanks, Lanny. I appreciate you coming on. You know, one Anytime. thing too, I was, I was going to say, and what about the 89 series and, you know, they're hockey hall of famer, no doubter. And I think some, sometimes people like forget that, you know, you go through adversity too, and everybody gets older. And, you know, sometimes I think that can, for, people kind of forget about that when you're a player of your caliber, but, you know, one thing to your credit there, because and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you were scratch games three, four, and five. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then Terry decides to to bring him back in for game six. And obviously, to your credit, you go down there and bury one. Um, I think that's <laughs> yeah. a, that's a, I mean, that's you get scratch and come back in and do that. That's that's excellent. And talk about battling adversity. And I think a lot of a lot of people just don't know that. And I think that's incredible. Well, I appreciate that, Kami. You know. When you first come in, you're fighting for ice time. When mm -hmm. your career in the middle section, you've got it. You've got all the confidence in the world. You're rolling. And then at the end of your career, you're fighting for ice time again. And uh, I looked at it as an opportunity. Yeah, I didn't play a whole lot, uh, uh, especially even in the regular season uh, that year. I think I only played 50 some games. Uh, but it was all about the team and knowing you had a chance to do what we all uh, want to do. And that's hoist the cup at the end of the year. And it couldn't have turned out better. And to be able to to uh, win the cup in Montreal uh, against that team and say, see you later. I'm out of here. That was so much fun. Perfect. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Hey, hey awesome. Lanny, in, in closing, when was the last time you shaved? Uh, you know what? 1974. Uh, <laughs> and I've been offered a few big oh. contracts. Oh, wow. you know, I'd have to go into hiding for two years. Years, so nope, <laughs> I'm not shaking it off. It's staying forever. No, keep it. That's that's how keep we all it. know you. Uh, uh, you know, next to Bret Hart, he is Calgary royalty. Lanny McDonald, Hockey Hall of Famer, and one of the great personalities of the game. Thanks so much for doing this here. Absolute pleasure. Take care, guys. Yeah, thanks, thanks Lanny. Lanny. Thanks, great Lanny. to see it. Well, the hits don't stop on this latest edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog.net, and. Razor, I feel like you should do the honors to bring this next gentleman in. Another cup winner. We are stacked with cup winners this week. We, yes, a cup winner. Um, a, a, a play. How many? Well, I was on a cup game winning skills? team. I was on a cup winning team. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to actually like, I'm going to be, uh, I, the skills, he's never heard the nice things I'm actually going to say to him here in the next 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> but I, I, I will... Uh, so, so the introduction is not the easiest thing in the world for me because because all I want to say is you used to just shoot the puck up into the 17th row. But the reality is uh, it was it was one hell of a career and uh, Toronto, Boston, Montreal. Not many guys have those three teams on the roster. And then, of course, a, a Stanley Cup in 09 with Sid the Kid and gang. And then um, pretty good career now talking, which he's always been very good at that. Surprisingly. 
I don't know if anyone wants to hear it, but I'm talking. <laughs> never stopped you. Okay. Never has, never will. Yeah. So I there's there's one thing that that um, I, I played with Hal right from when I started. So 1998, I get drafted. I go to Boston, and and he's the one year vet. He is a one year super vet in training camp, uh, pushing all us young guys around, playing whatever he wants and music ray bork sitting beside him rolling his eyes at him i'll never forget it <laughs> everybody don sweeney cam neely these guys are all what is this kid doing one year in the league um and and then played five six years we went to toronto together so uh my my best friend in hockey but but i get gilled out so that that was the, our thing was we would go on the road and about three or four days into any road trip after chucking our bags like his hat is <laughs> mentioning we would sit you know lobby in five but by day three or four it's it's uh, it was we were close enough i would come in to the room in the morning say all right skillsy i'm gilled out i'm done just leave me alone for the next three days and <laughs> that's how it would work and that's why we've uh, stayed great friends since. hey so sometimes it happens i used to love it we we drive from uh, yorkville to the rink and I'd pick him up and I'd be like, hey, buddy, what's going on? And he'd be like, uh, okay. I'd just zip it, listen to music. He wouldn't say a word after that. We'd just drive to the rink, go about our day. And, <laughs> you know, and then eventually he'd come back. And we'd start, <laughs> we could start talking and hanging out together. <laughs> Wait, and both you say, guys hey, are I in, need a pause. And both you guys are in media. Razor, you did you not get razored out? You know what, Razor, our, so our relationship is I'm the loudmouth, and he's the one that's like, what about this guy over here? And then I start <laughs> spouting about, you know, I'd, I'd be his megaphone. So he just used me as a puppet and just, <laughs> hey, what about that guy over there? And then I'd start chirping on this guy, and he'd just feed me the ammo, and I, I'd go at guys. So it, he was quiet and kind of reserved. He was a young kid. We, Razor, you were just a – you came into the league. <laughs> oh boy! Oh yeah, boy! Are you going to those stories already? <laughs> yes. yes. Like, all you know, of them. All of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, like you know, Razor was. How old were you when you went on the West 20. Coast swing? Yeah, that was a twenty. And Just turned twenty. When he's yeah. twenty years old. <laughs> oh boy! Oh yeah, boy is we, right. We had yeah. some good times. It was funny. You, you learned a lot that year. I did that day. <laughs> That day, I learned a lot. <laughs> that day. That day. Yeah. How uh, but media yeah. now, media now, and that's the best part of it. And what's the part like that you hate? Because I've had opportunities to get in. I've never done it, but I'm just interested. Or not hate, but maybe your least favorite. Hate might be a strong word. You know what? Um, the worst part I, I thought was going to be the worst part was, you know, I don't want to rip guys. I don't want to be that guy that's ripped the media that's ripping guys. That guy made a mistake. But I, I, I think I figured that out where I, I don't have to rip guys. I, you know, like I remember Philip Forsberg, I said something and the media got it and they, they kind of ran with it. And I was like, I talked to him and he, and he said, well, you would have told me the same thing right to my face. And I was like, well, yeah. And he's go, that's fine. You know, like guys, I, I think I got over that and I learned to deal with that. Um, so then, uh, you know, the, the big thing is the travel, which I love. And then, you know, there comes a time on the, you know, I'm on the road forever. I had two months where we were just traveling with Nashville this year and it was, it gets to be exhausting and um, it's, it's tough to get on a schedule, but um, you know, Ray, Razor's got the gig where he just stays home and does the home studio and does that. Um, that's, that's the way to do it. But, um, but I do love the road. So that's, the, <laughs> who are you yeah. kidding? What a <laughs> joke. Like I'm sitting here late, like, who are you, you know, you're not fooling anybody. Well, it, gets, it, can, it can get exhausting, but, I, you know, there's nothing better than, than, like you said, chucking your bags and walking around a city, even if it's Winnipeg, you know, even, it doesn't matter where it is. You can you can find a good time. And so that's uh, that's the big plus for me. So, um, so just skill, being around so skillsy, the game, being skillsy, around the game you, is great. Skillsy, do you leave, like, do you leave Nashville to, to rent, to dry out then? Like you're talking about looking forward to leaving Nashville. Everybody wants to come to Nashville and you're looking forward to getting out of Nashville here on these road I trips. Have friends, I have friends that come into town and, and I always laugh at them. They go, how do you live here? This is crazy. Well, I'm not on Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a life here. Like I, I, I pick up the kids and drop them off and I'm doing, 
you know, I'm, there's a life to be lived in Nashville, not just Broadway and chasing around bachelorette parties. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> although that, Hey, that's fun. If you want to come in, I'll show you a good time. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's, it's pretty easy living around here. So you can, you can decompress. Well, when you that, to that point, I remember Corey Hirsch uh, used to live in Vegas uh, several years back. And I remember asking him, well, what's, what's that like? And, and, and to that point, what you're saying, he, he would say, well, you always see everybody at their worst, right? Because everybody that's coming into Vegas is ready to, you know, you're on the strip. It's red. You're hydrating with Red Bull for the next three, four days. And you're just a zombie, right? Where, you know, the same thing I'm guessing for, for, you know, Nashville, which has become one of the entertainment capitals of North America yeah. or the planet for that matter. That's the same sort of approach for a lot of people that are ready to, you know, use the commie hashtag in one essentially for the next three days or whatever. Well, well, commie, I've seen commie do Nashville and he's done it right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, that was fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know what? It's, I always makes me laugh because people are like, buddies said, Hey, give me a list of things to do. Where should we go? What should I see? And I list out there's great restaurants and things to see country music hall of fame. There's golf courses. And in day two, undoubtedly, they find, well, we just stayed at Tootsie's, you know, like, well, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, well, did you eat anything? Well, we forgot. We forgot to eat. So we, we grabbed some barbecue on the way out, way home at three in the morning, you know, like that's basically what everyone does here. So um, it's pretty easy babysitting. When you have people come in, it just it, drop them off on Broadway and let them run. All right, Skillsy, 09, you're up. You're you are on the ice for one of the iconic plays, and and your celebration is one of uh, that it, it cannot miss. One that, of course, my kids love pointing out every single time that we see Flower diving across the ice in Joe Lewis stopping Nicholas Lidstrom oh, while yeah. you're battling by yourself in front of the net. <laughs> Just. You know, it, that was one so of the tell moments. Us, tell us through that ship and, and <laughs> the, the timeout and being out on the ice for that because it, it is one it, it's one that everybody knows. Crazy. Every yeah. and not everyone might recognize that Hal Gill was on the ice in that, but again, that's my proudest Hal Gill moment is is watching you out there every time I see it. Eyes are on Lidstrom and Flurry on that one. Uh, yeah. The bodyguard save, yeah, that was. You know what? Uh, like, I think anyone who's been through a cup run, like it. Like you're just exhausted. And so uh, that was it. That was like, if this, if we can last like 12 seconds, we can, we can win the cup and it'll all be over. And the way everyone's hurting. I remember thinking if this guy shoots, I'm going to block it with my face and hopefully they'll knock me unconscious. So I don't have to do the rest <laughs> of the shift. Uh, but yeah, like it, that, I remember that puck went off of me, went back, it goes to the backside. So I'm looking, trying to get back into the play, trying to dive, do whatever I could. And when Flurry comes across with that save, um, the the celebration, I I still hate myself because I kind of blacked out and went into the corner and drifted away. And I'm celebrating by by myself. I think it was Chris Kunitz. Thank God for Cooney. Cooney comes and runs over and jumps on me and brings me back into the conversation. But <laughs> it was like uh like I can't believe that didn't go in and that would have put us to overtime. Which you know I still think like how awesome would that have been to be in overtime in Game Seven. But uh, I'm happy the way it ended, and yeah. I, I wish I had worked on the celebration and planned it out a little bit better. But uh, yeah, it was the f the funny part is my kids watch that and they're like, "God, Dad, you are so slow, <laughs> <laughs> and you're so old." And they're looking at uh, the goalie equipment was like nowadays, you know, it's 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 a different game. And like I didn't, I don't think I went over the the far blue line that that whole series you know it's just up to the blue and back um but it, yeah that was uh that was a good run that was a lot of fun the party after was that was i mean that, that's what it's all about just being able to go to mario lemieux's house right after he had a party at his house catered party at four four in the morning it was awesome and that's you guys a, get you guys got out of Detroit right away, right after the game, gone. Yeah, we uh, we you know did the locker room thing, and then yeah, I, I remember being like, you, you, like exhausted, um, you know, drunk and getting on a plane. We had two planes, one for the families and one for us, so that was pretty cool to just be us on the plane. And then when we landed, there were shuttles going to Mario's house, and you know, like I, we were 
Well, I get in this fountain first because I was kind of joking around. We were waiting to get in, and so I, I geared right down and jumped into his fountain. <laughs> He's like, we have a pool in the back, you jackass. <laughs> you jumped in Mario Lemieux's fountain? Yeah, well, we were all hanging out in front waiting to get in. And, so, you know. Well, of course I did. Yeah, that, see, this is what I did for most of my career in the National well, Hockey League. I followed this yeah. guy around. Well, well, we all heard that story. Like, everyone talked about that. When I was growing up, it was the Pittsburgh Penguins losing the, the cup in the pool. And that was the story. It was got lost at the bottom of Mario's pool. And it was like, I wanted to be part of that so bad. And so all, all we had at that point was the fountain. But, uh, yeah, that was, that was a good time. That was, that was like as epic a party as you'll ever have. And um, even icing on the cake that it's Mario's. Is there is there a Sid story that comes to mind from your experience in Pittsburgh? Uh, you know, you talk about you know there's been so much about Connor Bedard here, this this next generational talent. Yeah. But you know, you look at Sid coming into the league almost 20 years ago. It's amazing how you think of all the hype, and we were all kind of there for it. But he probably even exceeded the expectations of what he was as a player, becoming one of the all time greats. But is there anything that comes to mind, or a story that comes to mind? Stories about, about Sid, uh, like no one's going to see this, right? <laughs> yeah, nobody's gonna see this. Yeah, no, it's just us. Yeah, we're, in a, we're in a safe. We're in a safe place. We're in a safe place. We're in a safe place. Yeah, uh, a safe place. Yeah. No, you know what? A, a lot of people, um, a lot of people don't realize how hard Sid works, and it's not. It, it's 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 something that kind of trickles down on the team. Like I remember, like first practice, I went out there. He's driving wide on me, and he, he you know, he's got those quads, and he gets so low, and he's driving wide, and and he's not backing off, and I had him. I just I needed to just push him and and knock him over, but he's going to the net. So I let him go, and he turns around. And he's like, "What the hell is that?" He starts yelling at me. This is like one of my first practices. I'm like, "Sid, I'm not going to throw you into the boards. Like that. This is practice." And he goes, "We got to be better than that. You, I want you to go hard." So he went hard in practice, and um, it was actually a couple practices before he was he was out of wasn't practicing. And I said, these practices are hard. And I remember Ryan Whitney turning. He's like, wait till Sid gets out here. It's going to go up a notch. Um, but he he went hard. And I, Billy Guerin came in, got traded. And that was something to see because, um, you know, Billy has a star power. And you know, he gets there and Sid's yelling at him the same way he yelled at me. And I'm like, oh, Billy, how are you going to handle this one? And he's like, <laughs> and like, Billy's like, is this kid for real? He's looking at me like this. This is crazy. Why is he yelling at me? Um but yeah, that was it was it was interesting to that fact that I was on the bus and I started ripping on Sid like I was you know I, I tried to ease into the team so on my second day I started ripping on Sidney Crosby and <laughs> and all the boys in the back of the bus they're like dude we don't do that you you don't you don't rip on Sid and I was like what do you what do you mean we, there's someone we don't rip on like what 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 are we doing here um, and so I like I I kind of backed it down in it. Like I still made fun of him, but it was like you know not the deep cuts. And then when <laughs> Billy got when Billy Garen came up, he was like, and just being him because he had that that respect and the star power that he could just go at him. I think it made I think it made Sid a better player because he was became more of the team. Now it, Sid was so he almost uptight. wanted it, right? He almost there was almost Sid, like an acceptance, like feeling like you're one of the guys more. Yeah, Sid was so uptight. Like it, there was one time he was. His, yeah, you know, he didn't get his points or something, and someone was like, "What's up with Sid? Why is he pouting? We won the game. He should be." And so I went up and talked to him. I'm like, "Are you all right? Like, what? Why put on put on a smile? We won." He goes, "You know what? That's bullshit. We we had that game, and we should have put it out. I should have scored two goals there. I missed one backdoor empty net, and we're not blocking shots at the end of the game trying to get it. We should have won that game five to two. Instead, it was three to two. And so that's the kind of pressure that he's had on his shoulders for his whole career and I think he's he's gotten a lot better you know like I've seen him on the road and I'll go and we'll go have lunch and he relaxes and he talks and like, he used to be dialed in like so structured and rigid you know he's the guy that when he throws a tape into the trash and he misses he has to go get it go sit back where he was throw it again throw you know again. if he misses he's got to go get it again go back to where he, and he'll do that until he gets it in he's just everything's got to be meticulous like that. And so um, having Billy, came, Billy come in, I think kind of his mind at ease, like he, he can relax a little bit and enjoy it. 
What's your favorite road city? Uh, all I mean, I know there's a lot. Winnipeg. Yeah. <laughs> you, said Winnipeg. Winnipeg. you said Winnipeg. You said Winnipeg. I'm just saying. Fun. Well, I'm just saying, if you can have fun in Winnipeg, you can have fun in anywhere. You can have fun in Winnipeg. World. Winnipeg's a fun you know? town. You just walk out with your boogers freeze and stab you in the brain. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I, you know what? I love obviously Montreal. You can't, it's tough to beat Montreal, but Vancouver is, is, uh, you know, one of the, one of my favorite, one of my favorite places until, until, until Rip and tore me one. Thanks, buddy. I, I oh. that one. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll tell this one. I'll tell this one. <laughs> Were you, I were you in this. Vancouver at the time? Were you so I was in Vancouver. Hal's in Montreal at the time. And we hadn't seen each other. He's staying the night. I think you, you, the usual three and four. Like he played in Edmonton the night before. So we're planning on dinner after the game. The Montreal stand and, and you know, the Roxy, the, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, So it turns into a blowout. Like we have a great team. It's the day. It's the, it was the game. Carrie price punched the wall in Vancouver and like did the whole thing. Right. Like he had, a, he lost his mind there. The lock goes in. It was like seven to one with a minute and a half left in the game. <laughs> and I'm chirping skills. the whole time on the bench. Like I'm giving it to everybody on Montreal. Cause I'm right beside and a minute and a half left in the game. Sure enough. Ripper. Paul skills you out in a seven to one game because because Ripping goes after the biggest guys on the ice. I was chasing after I think it was Glass. Yeah, Tanner Glass. I was chasing him everywhere, and he's like, "Screw you! I'm the, the game's over, you loser!" And he's like, "And I'm I was I was just fuming." And then I thought it was him. And finally, he said, "Okay, let's go." I turn around. I'm like, "Okay, who's, who's this little guy?" I just want to ask. Not give me the game notes on that one. He yeah, so you bagged me. Ripper him would... with like five lefts. <laughs> I'm on the bench. I'm like, oh no! A, like before I had the bobblehead going. Before <laughs> he draws skills, he drops the gloves. I'm like, oh no! <laughs> like I felt like I had to go get him. I'm like, oh no, this isn't going to be good. This is not going to be good. Go down, go down, go down. And sure enough, I... Ripper in his gold gloves just does the boxing moves on skills, and he's. <laughs> the most what happened? I'm like, no, we're supposed to hold on. You grab my shirt. I'll grab yours, and then we'll, you know, we'll throw like this, and I'll hold you out. And he was like, they're just working me, <laughs> hit rib shots. I was going, what the? I'm, I'm, I didn't know what to do. Fish out of water. I got after the game. Of, Razor's like, I'm sorry. I, I should have told you. And I'm like, I, I didn't I didn't know anything about this kid. You know, I was in the East and I came out and, and Ripper just tore me a uh, new one. I felt bad. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, Yale Town afterwards. I, I felt so guilty walking into that restaurant to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I had the same don't feel too bad. That wouldn't have been the only time it happened. I had the same thing. I was in Carolina. Vancouver came in. Long story short, I ran, I think, Byron Ritchie over. And anyways, I turn around, and Rippin's right there. And he's like, let's go. I'm like, who's this little fuck? I'm like, perfect. <laughs> I'm at home. So drop the gl- I don't know anything about him either. And so I started off pretty good. And I thank God I tagged him with one early. But it didn't really. I think I broke his nose. But it didn't really matter. But I'm throwing punches at him, and I'm for me, I'm like pretty aggressive. I got a pretty big size advantage here. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, I, I used thinking. to box a little bit too, but not like he did, which I learned. And all of a sudden, he's like slipping punches, and instead of like grabbing on, he's like blocking like a boxer. And I remember in my head, I'm like, oh shit! <laughs> and he hit me with like a left hook. I didn't even see it coming. I had to watch the video again because all of a sudden I could see, and then all of a sudden my vision was gone. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? Like my lights were turned out, but I, you know, I was moving and everything, but I couldn't see him. And he hit me with a left hook that the punch probably traveled four or five inches, maybe right on my chin. And for like the last 30 seconds, I couldn't see anything. And I just kind of mauled him. And thank God he didn't tag me with any more because I would have been done. But he was tough that, I mean, yeah. if he was bigger. He would have been murdering people. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Yeah. Anyways, don't feel too bad, Hal. Uh, I I feel bad all the time. It's uh, you know. (laughs) Razor said, "I got to go out in Vancouver. That's a good city." There you go. That's a good city. Perfect. Perfect. And and two W's for Rick Rippin over uh, what? Comedy, you're six four, and Hal, you're what six seven? Yeah. Oh, that's a slaying the slaying the Giants. They do. Um, Skillsy, honestly, best beat me in a fight. 
(laughs) (laughs) Tell me, tell me this for, we we talk a lot about the pressures of playing in a Canadian market. How razor, you guys can maybe both speak to this, but playing in Toronto, do the pros outweigh, like you guys are obviously at a time playing on a team that was kind of in a transitional time, but do the pros outweigh the cons or, or the cons, you know, like just in terms of the pressure of playing in that market, we've talked about 1967, how long it's been, but I mean, the, you know, there is still a membership has its privileges being a Toronto Maple Leaf, even when times are tough. Right. Yeah. I, I, I well, it, the hard part, well, the best part about playing in Toronto is backing the truck up and they load you up with Molson. And that was, uh, <laughs> what's the guy's name? Buds? Buddy, buddy buds. Hey buds, I just give him your keys and he'd load up your trunk with, with beer. And I was like, this is the best place ever. <laughs> I love this. Um, but it, you know what? I, it was, it was funny because well, the media is the media and the fan base can get so skewed. Like I remember they were all over Brian McCabe and saying he's this and that. I'm like, this guy is the best teammate I I I think I've ever had Razor. Is there a better team teammate no. than Brian McCabe? No, never. They're just as solid as they come, and I media would come up and be like, "Oh, it must you must be happy to get out of that locker room because Brian McCabe was." I'm like, "What are you? They're so delusional." And so they really tell the story that people listen, and and the real stories don't come out, and which was frustrating. I I felt like we were going in the same thing. Um, so you can speak on it too, but I feel like guys didn't want to talk. You just got scared of the media and you just backed off and got away because you, there's no way you could say anything good. And I know they gave, they gave me crap. They gave razor crap. It was just like, we're, we're trying to do the best we can here. Don't you, does anyone not see that? And then, you know, the lower level executive seats, they kind of fall in line with whatever really make an opinion on it i feel like the upper level seats they kind of watch the game and they take it in but the lower level who are we booing oh yeah boo he sucks you know i i forgot you know who's who sucks now okay we'll boo him um but i feel like the media and all that is that on the players um which is i i don't think they should none of that was necessarily deserved but it's a great city I loved it. I, we were up in Yorkville in our little cul-de-sac, and I'd go to um, Hemingways and down a six-pack after every game, and it was like it was it was pretty pretty good living there. And I think for the most part, if you're around the rink, you get bothered, you know. But where everyone was, you know, in Yorkville, everyone's more important than you anyway. You know, you <laughs> just ask them; they'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. But, well, I'll, I'll ask the a media question because that's what we're doing. Is well, what here, the, here, here, let me let me let me just say sorry, is it, let me just say in Montreal. Yeah, that's where I was going to go. I wanted the comparison to Montreal and how mm. that was different from Toronto because I live Toronto and and you 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 nailed it perfectly in saying it was it was very media driven in what was being done and said. And even if you tried to be honest and even if you tried to tell them, they ran their narrative the way they wanted to. It was never really player driven. I think it's more player driven now, but when we were there, it was it was pretty negative and pretty ugly and and pretty very media driven. Now the players have a lot more dictation of what's going on. But I'm curious how Montreal is different because um it is a different place. Well, so I was aware of that in Toronto. And so when I signed with Montreal, which was like, I'm from Boston. Like, that's is the, the worst thing to they were, do. Like, they, they were waiting to disown you, and, and you gave yes. them a very good reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, going up to Montreal, I'm like, I'm not going to play that game. I'm just going to be – and to be honest with you, who cares what they think of me in Montreal? Like, I don't I don't care about all these people. Like, And so uh, I remember – you know, it was uh, – Carey Price got up there, and I was honest and, you know, said what I wanted to say, and I stood in there, and, um, you know, I, I was assistant captain with Brian Jonta, and, and John's – like, Jonta was awesome. He was just like – he'd just stand in there and take it, and he didn't care. And, and I think we kind of – I kind of backed on him with that, just like, hey, let's say whatever we want to the media, and who cares? We'll – because there's enough noise there with the French media, the English, it, it kind of goes under the radar. You just kind of, it's all loud, you know? So 
Um, but I remember Carey Price got booed in an exhibition game. And after the game, mm-hmm. uh, and he wasn't good. It, like, he let in some bad goals, but it's an exhibition game. Like, why are they booing? We have 22,000 people <laughs> booing your goalie. Like, And he's awesome. Exhibition game. And yeah, an exhibition, exhibition game, game and for so Christ's sake. I, I called him ignorant. I went off on the fans. I said, that's the most ignorant thing I've ever seen for a fan base that's supposed to know hockey. You're out there booing a, a guy who's doing everything he can, worked hard all summer, and he had a bad game, and you're giving him shit. I, I, so I went off on him on the media, on the media to the media about the fans, and it was ironic. It was crazy because I, right after I went up to the PR guy and I said, "Hey, we're in one tomorrow morning. Just a heads up, you know, like this is gonna." I just said some bad things, um, and the next day everyone was like, "You know, we haven't seen that where people stand up for their teammates much, you know, like that. That was pretty cool that you did." I was like. Okay, all right. We spun this around like we, we're taking the right way, and um, they respected that. And and so after that, I was good with the media, which you know usually I'm like I'm the the target, the pylon, the slow defenseman that like let's pile on and like they did in Toronto, they did in. Boston. You never gave it away, skills. You never gave the fuck away no, ever. That's right. No, no. <laughs> Just and when you it. did, it was graceful. <laughs> yeah, it was graceful. Yeah, uh, but like. I, so I took a lot of heat and in Montreal, they kind of, they're like, they started to cheer for poke checks, you know? And <laughs> I feel like that's the difference between you no know, and Montreal is Toronto is just like, you, you just need to win. And Montreal, they're like, Oh, that was a good poke check. That was a good position play. They're like that great penalty kill They're, You know, and I always say in Montreal, and I love playing there because it, it wasn't a, a scream and a yell and then a dull. It was always a, ooh, ah, ah, mm-hmm. oh, ah, you know, like different <laughs> levels of appreciation for the game. And so I think I, I enjoyed, and it could have gone really bad and could have gone south quick in Montreal, but I enjoyed playing there. And But the other side of that is like everywhere you are, there's there you can't go anywhere in Montreal without – getting photos or autographs you know my my kids would be like dad do can we not sign today at the park so i can just play you know like you know it's one of those things so it can be tough but they're they were good people anyway they weren't they weren't trashing me like they did in toronto a couple times (laughs) no but there's a there's such a but there's such an energy in montreal though right when you're playing a game compared to you know it's funny because obviously there's so, I mean, Toronto is such a large, you know, it's one of the largest cities in North America. And so you get a lot of hockey players that are from the area when they talk about it being an event, but the atmosphere doesn't necessarily lend itself. I don't know how you guys found as players, but the energy isn't there compared to a lot of other arenas just because of the, the price point, right? Like there's a lot of corporate seats, you know, look at those platinum seats and, you know, as you talked about, well, who are they booing? It still about? happens. It's still at today. It's still today. Like the, the second no. period. I remember, hey, Razor, Maurice is <laughs> like, hey, we got to get through this first part of the second period. There's not going to be anyone there. We're going to have to generate our own. Yeah. Because people are still in their like, suites, right? Underneath. Yeah. They're eating their shrimp cocktail and then they come out and they try to catch up with the game. It was, it's like in Montreal, that doesn't happen. Like no, they're right. getting their Shen show and they're getting in their seats. Best hot dogs in the league, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Silzy, thanks awesome. for doing this. Uh, thanks so much. It is, uh, it's yeah, great to have you on. Thanks for listening and, to me uh, talk, Razor. And, and yeah. obviously. Gild out. Gild out. See you in June. See you in June. And as one of those shithead media guys uh, who had to put up with both you guys uh, back when you guys were both in Toronto, my apologies. And uh, oh, But on, at the same time, like how super happy when you, you know, to see you come away as a winner. And, and I think that was one thing that. Uh, you certainly earn the reputation razor. You can speak to this far better than I ever will be able to, but I think the one thing that I, I think that really became an endearing part of you as a personality in the hockey world was, you know, you were just such a lovable teammate, you know, anybody who played with you, there was just such a, you know, and I think there were a lot of media guys as well. How, when, when you finally won, there were a lot of people like there's a good guy who deserves to win that. So a tip of the cap to you, buddy. You're talking out your ass, but I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> well, we started recording early, and I figured I'd start drinking early, too. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks for having me on, guys. Thanks for coming, Hal. Cheers, Hal guys. Gil, Skillsy, joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog.net.
The Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net continues. He's Razor. He's Kami. I'm Sabalski. And uh, man, don't forget the road to the Stanley Cup has been filled with lots of action. All the upsets, all the goals galore, and the clearest route to winning big is to play with Bodog.net. Bodog has you covered for all the props, game lines, futures from now until the cup final and beyond. Make sure your power play and you can score big with Bodog. Check out the at Bodog CA Twitter page for details for how you can get up to 300 bucks of free cash to play with right now. Um, I want to get back. The, the draft lottery is in the books. We know that Connor Bedard, the next generational talent, is on his way to Chicago. Guys, I'm just going to say this. Man, that just felt dirty. I get that, you know, hey, going to an original <laughs> six market, going to an original six market is, is great for the National Hockey League. As a Bears fan, I love the city of Chicago, but from a team to get Connor Bedard after what we've seen over the last few years with the Blackhawks, like that is dirty. That is dirty on the just a couple of years removed from a sex scandal to get what a lot of people <laughs> thought was a lenient sentence with a $2 million fine. And, oh, hey, you guys are eroding as a franchise. No worries. Here's Connor Bedard. I don't believe the fix is in, but, man, I thought that was a horrible, horrible look for the National Hockey League. Go ahead, well, Razor. No, uh, the fix, to, is, but... fix isn't in. The, it isn't in. Um, now, if – so I'm going to take the emotion out of it. Um, that side of it, all, all of the the actual things that matter. I'm going to go right to numbers, which which is probably what matters to some people. Certainly, players, National Hockey League players around the league. Yep. And and I think it's it's poignant in this week, these two weeks, these coming weeks, what could happen to the National Hockey League with this playoffs? It's all looking good. If you're if you're a fan of TV ratings and escrow going down. It's not looking good if you're a player because you're staring at a Florida, Carolina, Vegas, Edmonton versus Dallas, Seattle. Um, there isn't anything there that is sexy. There is you get a Florida, Carolina Eastern Conference. I don't know who's watching that in May. I know people in Boston aren't. They're, they're just not. There's nothing compelling. That's a problem for the league. So. When I see Bedard go to Chicago, I think, and I know they have nothing to do. It's all ball, the balls, that the, the whole thing is not yep. fixed. But I think the NHL got that right because you needed that guy not to go to Anaheim. You needed, as a league, as a corporation, as a business, not him not playing at 1030 on a Sunday night every week. And... You needed him front and center in a huge market where you can sell. And, and you see the numbers that Chicago has literally been turned around within one ping pong ball. He's not even on the team yet. He's not even drafted. And, and it, it's five, six, seven million dollars worth of season tickets. So I, I get the 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 important stuff, and it is important. And, and I think that does make things feel dirty. Although I'm looking at it the other side of this could be an ugly playoff for ratings and escrow and and the best way to turn it around next season is have a chicago blackhawks team with a full united center and a bunch of primetime games that people will want to watch i'll agree i will say i mean i guess i don't really think it's rigged although i really wish i would have <laughs> no. taken a minute to look at it I was a little, I got a little off. I, I tweeted that the Arizona Coyotes are going to be picking first, but I got that because in my opinion, I'm like, Batman wants Phoenix to work, but the rink is too far out. Even if they approve it this month, it's not going to be done for, it's on a landfill. It needs like a year of rehab and then whatever it takes two, three years to build a rink. So that's too, too long. So I'm not saying the fix is in, but when it comes down to Chicago, Columbus or Anaheim, I really wish I would have got on Bodog and hit the Chicago Blackhawks <laughs> to get the you, first you, you overall pick. It's funny because you just I should have hit it was that. Coming. Well, and you could just feel it coming, right? And that's the that's the one thing where, you know, I feel for it. Look, big markets matter for ratings. Everything that you touched on from a business standpoint, right? A healthy New York Rangers, a healthy Boston Bruins, a healthy Chicago Blackhawks, a healthy Toronto Maple Leafs, a healthy Montreal Canadiens. But you look at a lot of these small markets that have been trying to rebuild and have been trying to tank and trying to hope for some ping pong ball luck over the last how many years since a draft lottery has been in, in place. 
And then you look in recent history. Like, let's just look at the last three, four years alone. The New York Rangers go for a rebuild, right? Remember, they, you know, you go back four or five years ago, it's like, we're selling off our assets. We're going to try to, you know, retool, rebuild. They sent out, they remember, they sent out that note to all the, you know, in the paper, like, we are rebuilding. Boom. Like, Alex Lafreniere. Now, Lafreniere has certainly become a work in progress and not what everybody mm-hmm. hoped for. But, like, the Rangers go back-to-back 2019 second overall pick with Capo Caco, and then they get Alex Lafreniere, the first overall pick. Now, granted, those guys aren't the reason why the Rangers have been Stanley Cup contenders, but, like, boom, boom. Like, what the hell? <laughs> and the Montreal Canadiens, they get to the Stanley Cup final two years ago, and then it's like – you know, Carey Price's hip fall and knee fall apart and Shea Weber's done playing and all of a sudden they have a one shit season and boom, first overall <laughs> pick, right? And here's the Chicago Blackhawks, like Same Taves thing. and Kane falling apart, right? Taves and Kane falling apart. Seabrook's not playing anymore. Duncan Keith's gone. Oh, there's a sex scandal. Uh, we're just shutting it down here. Boom, Eureka, you got the first <laughs> overall pick. Like, it's like, what the hell? How about Buffalo? How about Arizona? Like, there's fucking teams that have been bleeding for decades, and they get none of that. But then the big cities, hey, I gotta grab a big fat stogie and celebrate. <laughs> Bullshit. That's what I'm that. It's unbelievable. Uh, when can't argue. It. Oh, can't argue. It doesn't feel fair. And, uh, it, and, and Columbus, like, well, they really Columbus, did deserve it. Right? Columbus deserved it because I mean, that like you were there, God Tommy. Damn it! It's a bit. It is a town. It's a hockey place. They love it. They would have embraced it. It would have been great. They'd make a really good team out of it, and and they certainly deserved it way more than Chicago. So so I did use Anaheim as the example that you don't want them going there. You you could have put them in Columbus and really made it work, and and they would have been on ABC and ESPN every Sunday afternoon. That would have been okay too. Well, look at that fan base, Tommy. Yeah. Like when when they swept Tampa going back a few years ago, and you know it, it didn't go much further than the round two, but like that yeah. fan base showed that there is a market there that is passionate about hockey in the Buckeye State. There is a hundred percent a market there. Like they have not been over the course of their the Blue Jackets' existence overall. They have definitely not been successful. He would have liked to see some more success, and even. With, I mean, it took them 10 years to make the playoffs. I know that because the first time we made the playoffs was my first year there. We got swept in the first round, but nobody gave a shit. They were all fired up. Um, and they've won a round or two since then or whatever, but not much. Um, the fans are there. The fans are awesome. Columbus gets shit on. And you know, you got Russian players wanting to leave or whatever. And I just, I do not get it. Because that place, if they can get something together... And put some kind of, I'm not saying you got to win the cup. I mean, that would obviously help, but like put a little bit of a two, three year stretch together where they're like in the mix and, you know, maybe an Eastern conference finals or whatever, like making, win a couple rounds. Um, it would be awesome there. So yeah, the poor blue jackets just keep getting screwed. <laughs> or Columbus. Uh, yeah. All right. Hey, it's time for our uh, question of the week. And uh, hey, just a reminder for everybody, you can reply to this video wherever you're watching it at Bodog CA on Twitter. You can DM the, uh, or you can also DM uh, on the Bodog YouTube or Instagram page with a question for Kami, myself, for Razor. And if we pick your question, guess what? You get yourself a free NHL jersey courtesy of your friends and ours, Bodog. So this week's winner, Lily from Montreal, and she wants to know what it was like to grow playoff beards. So, Razor, this probably isn't a question for you. Yeah, let me go quick. <laughs> let me get out of here, and we'll, we'll let the man of the hour here, who's, who's yeah. infamous. What were they like? Did they get itchy? Was My, yeah, to shave? Uh, oh. they, if you can see this, this is like five weeks of growth that I have on my face right now. Not a beard guy. Ne- definitely couldn't grow one when I was 22, 23. It was very spotty and really got itchy in my mask. Like it was brutal with the goalie mask thing. So not much of a beard guy in any way whatsoever. Floor is yours, Kami. Let's hear the grooming you products that you had out. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, well, I got a lot of issues, but one issue I don't have is growing hair. So that was one <laughs> thing that I was actually pretty good at. Uh, and it kind of, it doesn't piss me off, but today, you know, like you got a lot of guys that, you know, and it kind of pisses me off because I put a lot of effort into this when I played. And now it seems like guys are getting a lot of credit for playoff beards when they have these things grown like for years. 
Like that doesn't yeah, Gudis count. Gudis doesn't count. Gudis doesn't, doesn't count. count. No, like, it doesn't you're count. You're supposed to shave right after the regular season and grow it from there. I thought that was the whole point. But I digress. Um, it wasn't as far as like itchy and stuff like that. It would get a little itchy. So my, the only thing I did, I just let it go. The only grooming I did, just because it would get like itchy on my neck. So I had to like shave my neck up to like kind of whatever, up up the neck a little bit. So then it wasn't always constantly rubbing. And then it was better. I would say the most painful part of it, though, was the two years that I went to the finals. The one year I was playing in Carolina, we finished June 19th. And the other year that I went to the finals, our final round was in Tampa. And that ended sometime in June, too. And I'm a sweater anyways. So the long hair combined with the thick beard, uh, there were some uncomfortable days of water, especially in Carolina, because I was there quite a bit of the time. So I spent a lot of time in air conditioning because I walk out in that humidity and I'd be like, holy Christ, I'm going <laughs> to feel like I'm going to pass out here. But uh, it was a fun thing. I, I did enjoy doing it for sure. You'll yeah, it kept me in the league. Com- if com- I'm yeah. Being honest, I know, man. <laughs> there's still people. There's people. I, uh, there's uh, how many people that I talk to? There's like, oh, you do a podcast with uh, with Kami. How you, you got to tell him to grow his hair again? There's <laughs> always somebody who references you growing your hair back again. Next time I go to Carolina, I haven't been there that much. Last time I was there was the uh, the outdoor game, but before that, it's been a while. I guess there might be some plans if they make it to the third round here, maybe to go out there. But I think next time I'm in Carolina, I don't think I can. I If I, my hair isn't grown out, I might as well just fire a wig on. And I'm not even going to bring clothes. I'm just going to bring a bathrobe because it's the only <laughs> questions I answer. I'm pretty sure a lot of these people didn't know I was really even playing. I think they just thought I was like, I was the mascot. Because that's all I get. Where's your bathrobe? Oh, you cut your hair. I'm like, high and tight these days. You know, I'm trying to work. I and, forgot uh, about yeah. the bathrobe. The bathrobe. Oh, the bathrobe. So, so what are you going to do? Like the hurricane horn with the the bathrobe and the I, wig. I think, the I, I, think I have three. to. That's I think it. I'm just going to oh, waltz in there with be... just a white bathrobe on, and nobody, everybody will be pumped. That'll be Rocks amazing. And a white bathrobe. Absolutely amazing. And amazing. Crank that uh, thing and <laughs> pound some drinks. <laughs> I, 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 voicing the video game uh, for EA Sports, we went down yeah. to LA for a few days to voice with Snoop Dogg a few years ago for one of the years and uh, spent two days in his studio. And the one day Snoop came to work just wearing a bathrobe. Like, <laughs> just Tommy came to work came because he can, right? So, yeah. Tommy, you're, uh, you know, you're not alone. There's clearly other. I'm not. I'm not Snoop Dogg. I'm. I'm not. I'm not to that <laughs> level. But I do like his style. Yeah, he just kind of rolled with it with the <laughs> yeah, bathrobe. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll say this just quickly on on the beards. I I never learned the proper beard etiquette, but I had worked in television for years, and TSN launched a radio division in Toronto. This is like 2011, and my producer and I thought, you know what, having to be clean shaven for all these years in TV. Let's grow playoff beards over the next two months, right? Because why not in radio? Why not? And so, and I, my, my youngest daughter was, you know, we were expecting her right around the time of the cup final, but I had grown this, you know, pretty good beard over two months. But what I didn't realize was the sort of beard etiquette and manicure that you kind of have to, you know, you you take a shower, you do your thing, but like, you know, you got to moisturize, you got to shampoo, you got to condition. Got to clean it. Yeah didn't really think about all that Ugh. much right so i just remember walking through a mall in toronto one day and kind of giving a good itch because you know you get an itchy beard and all of a sudden i had like a dark shirt and i was like it looks like snowflakes all over. <laughs> <laughs> just a shit ton of beard it's <laughs> getting a little dry the animal yeah <laughs> like, oh, that's why. i need to moisturize at some point so uh on that note everybody's disgusted and uh we're gonna get out of mm-hmm. here uh he is andrew raycroft he is mike commodore i'm james sabalski also shout out to our producer Stu stone in the meantime in between time we will see you next time here on the clearing the crease podcast powered by bodog.net